All right, uh, so we ended on Friday uh, with me doing pretty much everything I could to melt your brains trying to explain relativity and quantum theory to you guys. Um, I think I saw Asher at least do this one time. So that was really what I was going for. Um, so I'm not going to expect you guys to like explain in a paragraph like what relativity was or what quantum theory was. Uh, but I do want you to know uh, kind of like the big takeaways. So what was like, what are some of the big takeaways from relativity and quantum theory? Science was to say Yes, that's a great way of summarizing it. Faith and science was destabilized. Like going all the way back to the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, people basically assumed like even if we disagree on everything else, we can agree on science and science will lead us forward toward the truth. And uh, there was the movement known as positivism that was big during the Victorian era that basically believed that we would eventually figure out everything by solving all the different fields of science. We had already solved physics, we were on our way to solving chemistry, and soon we would even solve the question of man. We would solve anthropology and stuff like that. Uh, but the new physics basically explodes that idea. Um, so with a loss in faith of science, what do you think that would do to European culture? Like, how, how would that affect, how do you think that would affect you if you Disturbed morality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a shift in moral standards. Like, well, if we don't, if science is fake, then yeah, we can do whatever we want. Yeah, and I guess yeah. <laughs> we don't know anything. Nothing matters. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Okay. Other ways. Yeah, actually that does happen. There's a big growth of like new cults during this time period. There's one cult known, known as Theosophy, which is like loosely based on Hinduism. There's another cult, uh, a lot of people get really interested in like westernized versions of Hinduism. Um, kind of like how people are like really into yoga now. It's not quite the same. Um, yeah, so there's an increasing interest in like spiritual answers when the people's faith in science is shaken up. Um, okay, cool. So I want you to keep all of this in mind. These breakthroughs are happening at the same time as a number of very important philosophical breakthroughs. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at three major philosophers today who basically undermine assumptions about, um, uh, assumptions about like enlightenment social theory. Uh, so we're going to be looking at Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, Max Weber, and uh, most importantly, probably Sigmund Freud. All three of these guys are interesting because they apply enlightenment theory, but they undermine enlightenment assumptions with their, with their ideas. Um, and so together with the new physics and then these three thinkers, basically the enlightenment crumples. Nobody is walking around assuming progress and uh, like the slow, gentle step, step-by-step -step progress uh, of like science and society that people were assuming during the Victorian period. Thank you, Jack. Yep. Uh, so we're going to start first with Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, any history of philosophy, no matter how short, will include Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, he's up there with Plato and Descartes. Uh, as one of the major, major thinkers of Western of the Western uh, philosophy, um, like a lot of people, though nobody really pays attention to him during his lifetime. Uh, he only becomes in very famous after he goes insane. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was the son of a Lutheran pastor born in Prussia. He grew up in a very conservative household, raised uh, primarily by his mom and sister. Um, he was given a scholarship by a wealthy guy in his town when he when he was found like reciting whole chunks of the New Testament. 
from memory. So he was sent to um, a fancy private school where he learned Greek and Latin and uh, stood out even among this fancy private school as like a true prodigy. By the time he was 30, he had earned his PhD and was already a full professor at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Um, and he worked there for a little while. Uh, he was super interested in ancient uh, Greece and was a translator of Greek texts. Uh, around the, around, he fell deeply in love with a woman named Lou Salome, who said, you had a, Are we good? You're out of space on your SD card. I swap one out, oh. so you should be good now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so Nietzsche was deeply in love with a uh, female academic and writer Lou Salome, who uh, uh, friend zoned him, and then uh, later went on to become the lover of the great modern poet, uh, uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, and then later went on to be intimate friends, whatever that means, with Sigmund Freud. So this lady, Lou Salome, basically went around collecting geniuses, but uh, just friends with, with Nietzsche. So anyway, um, Nietzsche drops out of his job at the university and lives on a small pension for the rest of his life from 1880, or well, not for the rest of his life, until he goes insane, from 1880 to 1888, uh, spending most of his time in the high mountains of Switzerland at a place called Sils Marina. Uh, and there he writes a number of uh, short, punchy, philosophical works that go pretty much unrecognized uh, during his time as a sane individual. He actually has to pay for their own publication, uh, so he's not making any money. Um, he goes for long walks, talks to himself, and scribbles and reads. Uh, as he, he has a mental breakdown in the Italian city of Turin in 1888. Uh, he is riding in his room when he hears a man outside beating an old horse um, that refuses to pull the wagon. He runs outside, throws himself between the rider and the horse, and hugs the horse, and then collapses weeping in the road, and from then on is completely insane. He writes a number of letters to his close friends that day and the following days, and signs them Jesus Christ, Dionysus, um, the Crucified, other things like that. He also composes a number of piano pieces during this time, which uh, I've actually never listened to them. I think they're hard to find, but if you can find them, I would totally be down to listen to some of Nietzsche's stuff. So that's Nietzsche's life. He he basically is the stereotype of like the rejected mad genius, but he is truly a genius. Um, his work in you want to play it? Yeah. So some insane Nietzsche music. Go for it. Turn it up. Oh yeah, that's way before he went crazy. Was he like composing before? Uh, he was always very interested in music, and he actually introduced some really interesting ideas on musical theory that I won't go into. All right, go ahead and pause that. Yeah, so that seems totally unoffensive. I, I, I hope that his insane stuff is like totally crazy, but it's probably just kind of bad. Um, okay, so uh, let me tell you about some of Nietzsche's ideas. Also, just on a personal note, uh, Nietzsche was. Uh, the philosopher that really captivated me and the one that I studied the most during undergrad. Um, he offers a critique of all previous philosophers and also a really powerful critique of the modern age that spoke to me and uh, really kind of drew me in. So, uh, yeah, I'm a little biased toward Nietzsche, except for his anti-woman stuff, which I think you could just chalk up to his sad biography. <laughs> Um, anyway, okay, so Nietzsche has a whole lot of ideas and they kind of are all over the place and you have to piece them together yourself. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple excerpts from him in our reading. Uh, one of his first major ideas was something that he called the death of God. And this is different than just being like an atheist. Uh, Nietzsche was an atheist, but he, he didn't just argue that God did not exist. 
He rather argued that God had died and that modern man had killed him. Uh, and so what Nietzsche meant by this was that the advance of science and reason had made it impossible for Western man to have a God. Uh, another way that he puts it is that God had become culturally irrelevant in the industrial enlightened age. Uh, that even if people still went to church, they were, they, God was still dead. Um, the church was no longer a powerful social force. And if you think about this, like, think about the church when we started the course and the church now. Like, when we started the course, the church could start a war, could depose kings, call the shots. And this was all built on a foundation of truth, like, deep belief. Nowadays, in, in the 1890s, the Pope really doesn't have that much power or control over the course of events. And rulers, even rulers who claim to be Catholic, more or less just ignore the Pope whenever they feel like it. So Nietzsche argued that regardless of whether or not you believe in God, he's dead. And if you, if you sniff, you might even smell God decomposing. <laughs> yeah, Asher. Doesn't science replace God as a God so people start worshiping instead science? Um, so it yeah, just so, depends, I guess, on how you define God as an entity that we worship. Yeah, I think, science I think Nietzsche would agree with you on that. Okay. So like, has, has science simply become the new idol? Um, Nietzsche actually wrote a whole book called The Twilight of the Idols, where he talks about how various things that people have put forward are all crumbling. So he says, God is one idol, which we can no longer hold on to. The stake is another idol. He has a chapter called The New, the New Idol, which is we all bow down before the state or the nation. And science is another one. Uh, Nietzsche is very highly critical of science, and anticipating some of the breakthroughs of critical or, uh, quantum theory, he argues that science does not actually lead to truth, but simply leads us to more and more powerful interpretations of reality. Uh, so he would also be opposed to the sort of like scientific idea of truth and progress. Uh, good question. Other questions? Cool. I'm going to give you a, a section from one of his books called The Madman, where he first uh, announces the death of God. Um, the ne another thing that he does is um, Nietzsche argues that there is no such thing as morality, or rather that morality is simply invented by humans. Uh, and he outlines this idea in a couple of books. One is called The Genealogy of Morality, and the other is called Beyond Good and Evil. And in both of these works, he points out that uh, he kind of traces the evolution of different moral systems and shows how mor morality seems to result more from different groups striving for power and control over one another um, than from any sort of objective source. Uh, and famously, he points out that nobles, like in the medieval period, had one set of morality that included stuff like pride and revenging any sort of insult, honor, strength, and then that poor people, peasants, slaves, tended to have a different type of morality. That was one of mercy and kindness and caring. And um, so rather, he argued that neither of these systems was actually right, and they were both simply expressions of your uh, position within structures of power. So you say moral? Uh, he sometimes calls himself an amoralist or an immoralist. Uh, he argues that he argues that we construct systems of morality, and what he believes that a, a honest and free individual should do is openly admit that moral judgments are our own creations. That we should own our morality rather than allowing morality to own us. So you would say murder isn't bad because we know it's bad. It's bad because society tells us it's bad. Uh, well, so is murder bad? So murder in itself is already kind of a loaded term if you think about it because murder means like bad killing, right? Right. So no, but, I mean, it's just a, a way to differentiate killing, yeah. which isn't uh, inherently bad. Yeah. 
So, so think about it from like the aristocratic noble point of view, right? The nobles get their power from the fact that they're really good at killing people. And, in many cases, killing people is actually viewed as morally good. So think about like the old tradition of dueling, which was actually still around at this point. So like if somebody like sleeps with your wife, it's actually morally appropriate for you to smack them into the face and demand satisfaction. And then for you guys to shoot at each other with pistols or have a sword fight. And if one of you dies, that is an honorable death. Uh, however, from like a different perspective, you could say, well, that's stupid and immoral, and you both have better things to do than be shooting at each other in the park on an early, like early on a Saturday morning, right? Um, yeah, so murder depends on your position. What counts as murder versus what counts as a legitimate act of violence? All right, uh, Nietzsche, was, Nietzsche also was a radical skeptic. He basically argued that there was no such thing as truth. So there's no God, no morality, no truth. Um, so I want to skip some of those points. And if you've already written down all of them, draw a little arrow from the one at the bottom, will to power, up to these first three. So. What Nietzsche argued is that the only thing that is really going on in the world is that everything in the universe expresses its power. It does what it has to do. Bombs explode. Tigers eat gazelles. And people make up systems of morality and try to know things. That is, uh, so he argues that all human behavior is simply us expressing our inner drives for power, basically for acting on our instincts. So we have, we have an instinct to construct a system that says what we are doing is good and what other people that oppose us are doing is bad. And we all have, also have an instinct to try and organize the world in some sort of way that we can use it. And so what he argues is that both morality and knowledge really are is simply different modes of us trying to express our power. Um, and so like, and that's why really all science is, is going from a less powerful explanation to a more powerful explanation. And that's only the real, that's the only real criteria that we can use to distinguish relativity theory from Newtonian mechanics is that relativity allows us to do more stuff than Newtonian mechanics. Uh, so for Nietzsche, the ultimate explanatory principle is that all things strive for power. And of course, when you get down to like molecules, does it make sense to talk about it in terms of power? Not really. But everything does what it can. Every individual strives to control its, its own little tiny world. Any questions there? Does this make any sense? He basically tears everything down. He calls it philosophizing with a hammer, which you can see there. He says that the first task for a philosopher is to destroy all of the beliefs in anything. Because pretty much our entire world is constructed out of fictions. One fiction that he particularly hates is Christianity. And he is, uh, during his lifetime, the people who do read his works call him a nihilist. Are you guys familiar with that term? What is nihilism, Gustavo? Uh, kind of just like believing that nothing really matters. Yeah. Yeah, nothing really matters. So would you say, based on what you know about Nietzsche, that he's a nihilist? Yeah. There's no God, no truth, no morality, no purpose. Nihilism, right? So. What Nietzsche argues, though, is that he's not the nihilist. He argues that the Christians are the nihilists because the Christians are clinging to an obviously false view of the world because they are afraid of meaninglessness. The Christians are the ones who are denying reality. How that make them not the nihilists? It's, it's because, well, so he's not saying that the Christians 
don't think anything really matters. But he's saying that the Christians are refusing to face the world. They would rather believe in something false than to accept the harsh truth about the world. So he's not the one rejecting life. He says the Christians are the ones who are rejecting life. They are rejecting the world as it presents itself and substituting for it an obviously false version of reality. And so he says he's not the nihilist. He is accepting life and trying to confront it honestly. And it's the Christians who are the nihilists because they are hiding behind a like, shield of myth. Uh, and he, uh, he elucidates these arguments in his book, The Antichrist. Also, if you want to read any of his stuff, I've got all his books. Um, OK, and last of all. All right, what are we supposed to do then? Nothing means anything. We're all just individuals blindly striving for power. God is dead. Uh, so what Nietzsche argues is that we should strive to first accept life as it really is, and then strive to embrace it and find joy in the total freedom that this reality gives to us. Because there is no God, because there are no morals, because there's not really even any such thing as truth, we are totally free to create a life for ourselves. And he had done that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think he did have a really great time for those eight years when he was up in the mountains writing and talking to himself. He was, he was living, living his dream. But the people in the little Swiss village where he lived called him the monk because he lived in like a little wood shack and like just ate a whole bunch of fruit. He didn't even smoke cigarettes or drink beer. He's totally, totally straight laced, high on life. Um, so he argues that what we have to do is we have to accept the world as it is and embrace it and create our own values and live according to our own personal imperatives. So extreme individuality. Yes, he is an extreme individualist. And he calls somebody who can create their own values and live freely according to what they believe in the, the ubermensch, or the, the superhuman. This is like the origin of all of today's societal norms. Yeah, so I think... Do what you want as long as it doesn't mess the people up. Yeah, so I think Nietzsche actually is far more um, influential than people realize. And a lot of people are actually embracing Nietzschean ideas without having ever read Nietzsche. That's how you know you've become a really powerful philosopher. For example, he coined the phrase, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, which was recently covered by uh, Katy Perry, right? Kelly Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson. Whatever. The original was better. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, one unfortunate thing about Nietzsche, other than the fact that he died from syphilis, um, and that nobody read his works until he was crazy, uh, was that he was later appropriated by the Nazis. Uh, his sister was an anti-Semite. And when Nietzsche went crazy, his sister inherited all of his works, and she specifically withheld large parts of Nietzsche's work, uh, and then edited some of his books to make it seem like the Germans were the Ubermensch and the Jews were everybody else. So, but so if you look at what Nietzsche's actually saying, you'll see that his ideas are totally anti, to, like go totally against what the Nazis stand for. Specifically, his extreme individualism goes totally against the sort of like Nazi idea of like collective nationalism and sacrifice and stuff like that. Um, he does say some bad things about Judaism because he thinks it's a like nihilism just like Christianity. But in terms of like, he's fine with Jewish people. It's it's Jewish ideas that he takes issue with. Yeah. If he has, if he doesn't think morals are constant, then what do you think that the Nazis just create their own morals to have the Holocaust and the Holocaust was justified? Well, sort of. But uh, I think, so Nietzsche's own personal morality seems to be one of radical honesty. And he would argue that the Nazis are constructing huge new false idols. False idols of the blood, of the, of the folk, right? Like, this is just as fake as Christianity. And so rather than each individual freely expressing and pursuing 
their own like dreams, right? You've got a tyrannical state that is forcing everybody to like bow down before what is obviously a fake version of history. So uh, I, I think that if Nietzsche had been alive when the Nazis had come to power, he would have been vehemently opposed. Okay, but well, what do you say the Holocaust was bad? I mean, like, well, so, if you don't be more, I don't see. Yeah, like, yeah. Ignore morals then, or, or if you don't think morals are constant, then killing a bunch of Jews in a gas chamber really isn't that bad. Yeah. Well, um, so if you don't believe that morality exists, you can't say that something is objectively good or bad. Right. Uh, but what Nietzsche could say is that uh, it was. It, it, I think it went against Nietzsche's personal code. Of, of morality. He's not saying that we shouldn't have morality, but rather that we all need to construct our own moralities. And so, yeah, sure, you could argue that like Hitler invented his own morality and like pursued that. Um, but I think Nietzsche and the values that you can see in his philosophy would have been deeply opposed to it. Because he, he is all about individual, um, like individual development and freedom. Uh, so he wouldn't have said that the Nazis were bad, but he would have called them dishonest and bowing down before false idols and you know nihilists and stuff like that. So is that the same thing as bad? Yeah, I guess so. I just don't see how morals can be relative. Yeah, okay, so if morals are relative, then that means you can't say the Holocaust is bad. Right. And the Holocaust is obviously bad, so there must be some objective system of morals, right? Yes. No. Alright. Yeah, I mean, denying morality definitely creates some problems. Including, like, feelings like uh, nothing matters. Uh, here's some good quotes from Nietzsche. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. The last true Christian died on the cross. <laughs> um, in heaven, all the interesting people are missing. There are no facts, only interpretations. That's his anti-science thing. Um, woman was God's second mistake. What was his first? Man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> A casual stroll through the lunatic asylum proves that faith alone proves nothing. There is not enough love and goodness in the world to permit giving any of it away to imaginary beings. <laughs> and insanity in individuals is rare. But in groups, parties, nations, and epochs, it is the rule. That's so very good. I know. He, um, most other philosophers during this time, especially German philosophers, write in like huge, disgusting, like paragraph-long sentences that don't make any sense. Nietzsche uh, writes in pithy aphorisms. Chapters of his books will be like three sentences. He, he calls his writing style dancing with a pen. That's one reason why Nietzsche is so popular. And why I like him so much is because he makes his points with a punch. They're memorable, and uh, you know, it's like he's like simultaneously like dissing other people while expressing. It's good. It's good stuff. All right. So anyway, next up, our boy Sigmund Freud. First of all, let's all get this out of the way. Sigmund Freud, for a lot of his life, struggled with a cocaine addiction. He believed it was a wonder drug that could be used to treat depression, along with other things. And uh, he once wrote this to his fiancée. Woe to you, my princess. When I come, you shall see who is stronger, a gentle girl who doesn't eat enough, or a big wild man who has cocaine in his body. <laughs> 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 that is threatening. Yeah. Uh, he also uh, was obsessed with smoking cigars. Um, he argued that this might have something to do with the fact that he uh, was still fixated on oral stimulation. Uh, <laughs> uh, he smoked cigars uh, to the point where he started to get serious respiratory and like mouth cancer-y type problems. Um, apparently, just attending one of Sigmund Freud's like psychology meetings was a was a hazard because the room would be so filled with smoke. You're more or less required to smoke a cigar while you. So anyway, uh, Sigmund Freud was a, uh, a Jewish doctor, active in Vienna. He came from an upper middle class uh, family of university educated folk, um, kind of like uh, mid-level bourgeois Jewish family in Vienna. Now, remember, he is growing up in Vienna while Karl Luger, the anti-Semite, is winning an election and building an anti-Semitic party in Vienna. So 
here's this highly educated guy watching as the people of Vienna vote for a guy who is obviously lying and espousing uh, like incredibly simplistic anti-Semitic uh, ideas and, and beating other people who are basing their political platforms on like you know rational understandings of economics and history. Um, Doesn't Luger denounce anti-Semitism though in his private life? He does. Yeah. And so even Luger admits that he's lying. He's saying, I'm just lying to win votes. And everybody's like, good move. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Sigmund Freud basically lived and worked in Vienna. Um, he, fled, he was forced to flee uh, Austria when the Nazis took, it, took over Austria in uh, 1938. Uh, and he spent his last few years in Britain before he died from complications relating to smoking, not to cocaine. <clears throat> so um, uh, Freud is, is probably one of the most consequential figures in intellectual history. Uh, pretty much everybody in the West today is in some ways a Freudian. Even though Freud's more specific theories are largely denounced by practicing psychologists today, some of his basic assumptions are now just seen as obvious. They're not even contested. Most little kids even think about themselves in Freudian terms today. Um, and if you look back at like earlier psychological works like Descartes' Meditations, you can see that they haven't gone, th they haven't made the breakthroughs that Freud uh, makes. Specifically, and most importantly, Freud argues that the conscious mind is not capable of examining itself fully. So if you close your eyes and meditate and think back to your most important memories, can you actually access all your memories? Do you actually know which experiences had the biggest impact on you? Do you know why you feel a certain way about certain things? Why you dislike a certain person? Why your favorite color is your favorite color? Freud argues that large parts of our minds are controlled by irrational impulses and instincts that we cannot actually see operating. Some people say, uh, Freud's theories of the mind, uh, it's a little bit like an iceberg. So the parts of the mind that we can actually observe, the conscious operation of our mind, is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a huge invisible section of our mind constantly operating and churning that every once in a while spits up stuff into our conscious awareness. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thought? Like, you don't understand what's going on inside of you. Yeah, he's saying that you don't actually know yourself. That there's just stuff going on that we don't know about. Yeah, like, deep stuff. Like, um, you know, like, think about the, like, an example. For example, uh, like, a little kid who is sexually abused when they're eight. They probably don't understand what's happening and might actually forget the experience. But does that experience go away? Many psychologists have found that actually these experiences have long-lasting effects on the kid but that the kid himself is not even aware of, uh, but that they can manifest in anxiety, in mistrust of strangers, and stuff like that. And so the kid doesn't know why he's afraid of strangers, but it's probably because he was sexually assaulted as a, as a small child. And one thing that a psychologist can do is help people to explore their unconscious and unpack. It's like it's like a big basement where you keep all the bad stuff, uh, but every once in a while the bad stuff busts out and messes up your actual life. And uh, so for Freud, Freud's idea was that a psychologist's main job was to help people unpack all of this baggage and help them to come to a more rational understanding of all of these drives and impulses that they have going on inside of them. Um, okay, now, next step. We have this giant basement of our minds. Freud argues that the two main drives 
within our, within our minds, our subconscious minds, are the drive to violent domination and the drive to sex. Dominate and copulate. Um, it's interesting that he's writing in a time period where sexual repression was at kind of an all-time high. Remember, as we talked about, uh, in the Victorian era, uh, respectable married couples were not even supposed to enjoy having sex, and they were encouraged to remove as little clothing as possible during the act. So that you could be proper. Uh, so Freud is arguing that we have these massive drives and if we don't act on them, they don't go away. They simply continue to operate in our subconscious. So you can't just, you can't just make these go away by pretending they're not there. Now, next idea. He argues that civilized society is basically founded on the repression and redirection of these irrational desires. For example, one of the very first things that happens within agricultural civilizations is the domination of women by men. He argues that this is closely linked with male drives towards domination and competition over sexual objects. Quote, unquote. Uh, and then civilizations construct all sorts of elaborate rules over when and who is allowed to do it, and when and who is allowed to perform acts of violence. So it's all about regulating and controlling irrational desires. He's kind of testament to that, wanting to like, smash his girlfriend like a kid. Yeah. Dominating. Well, I mean, so you can imagine that Freud had a whole lot of stuff going on, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of weird stuff I'm not telling you about that's more or less ignored nowadays. Like, he argued that all men wanted to kill their fathers and have sex with their moms. That's not really widely accepted today. Uh, it might have been true for Freud. Projecting a little bit. What's up? He's projecting a little bit. Yeah, projecting, which is another Freudian concept. Um, okay, so uh, those are his ideas about civilization and man. So what he argues is that the reason that there's so much psychological illness in society today is because our irrational drives are coming up against conflicts and barriers constructed by civilization. And there's no, there's no healthy way for us to, or we haven't figured out healthy ways to get these drives under control. Uh, and so he argues that the job of the psychologist is to help people figure out and understand their unconscious drives, and then to figure out better ways to deal with them. He calls this sublimation. It's not on there. You don't have to know it. But basically he says you need to find better ways to uh, act on your irrational desires. So you might have like anger problems, and maybe you take up like boxing as a way of getting out your rage in a way that's not disruptive. disruptive. Or, um, Maybe you need to get a divorce from an unhappy marriage so you can better fulfill your sexual drive, which could be manifesting in like all sorts of weird neuroses and stuff like that. So for Freud, psychotherapy was all about figuring out what your irrational drives were and then figuring out a rational way to channel them so that they don't destroy your life. One way that he tried to figure out what people's irrational desires were was by interpreting their dreams. He believed that dreams were where we uh, underwent the fulfillment of our irrational and impossible desires. So like, the dream of flight might represent our dream for freedom from domination of others, or if we dream of like, I don't know, he was really into phallic imagery. He thought everything was like symbolizing a phallus. Yeah, He used no actual evidence of that, obviously, right? No, except for his experience as a psychotherapist. So he, he actually developed methods of psychotherapy and then uh, worked through uh, people's problems with them. And seemed to have some success within Vienna. So I think one critique 
that you could make of Sigmund Freud is that rather than diagnosing humanity in general, he was rather diagnosing Austrian bourgeois people. Um, but he did seem to have some success with his patients. And even if his ideas are wrong, giving somebody an explanation for what's going on and giving them some, something to work with can many times be helpful in itself. Uh, but yeah, in terms of like rigorous scientific analysis, no. And many of his psychotherapy uh, uh, approaches are no longer trusted today. Like for example, you will have a very hard time getting medical insurance to pay for you to see a Freudian psychoanalyst because there's not a lot of data backing up that that's an actually effective method. So what would he do? Would he just like put it together? Um, no, his, so his main method, uh, you often see this like stereotyped in, uh, in movies and stuff, is you would lay down on a couch, usually in like a, a pretty comfy room, maybe with like, uh, like tapestries on the wall and like Turkish rugs and like little statues of Buddha all over the place. And you'd lay down and uh, the psychologist would sit behind you where you couldn't see him. And the psychologist would ask you questions and would just listen to your responses and then would probe at certain points to try to get you to dig deeper. And after many hours of this, 